If y'all would turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6, and uh, whew, boy, it's been busy around here this past week, and of course, next week will be busier, I guess, if that's even possible. But um, thank you, I'd like to welcome the visitors, and uh, normally we do have nursery and all that going on, but because of everything being set up downstairs, Michelle wanted that all that they've done down there to be a surprise to the kids coming in coming in tomorrow, so uh, therefore everybody's upstairs today. Um, we're now at the point, as we, you know, we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount, we're now at the point that is, we've come to the point that's generally re- referred to as the Lord's Prayer. Some people refer to it as the Disciples' Prayer. I don't care to argue the point, uh, but some people make a big deal out of that. Either way, It is a prayer that Jesus used as a model prayer, but it's also much more than that because the prayer is actually steeped with a lot of Old Testament hyperlinks, and y'all know we like to do that here. Then these hyperlinks reach deep back into the story uh, of the Bible and and God's plan to eventually restore things the way back to the way they were before the fall. Now, I grew up hearing this prayer in church. I'm sure a lot of you did too. But it was that's not the way I memorized it. You know, I didn't memorize it from hearing it here and there or whatever. I memorized it by playing baseball. Because before every game, we said it. Everybody got in a circle, put their hands in, and then we recited it in the best King James that we knew. Because, I mean, back then, that's about all, well... That's what most people use. And so um, that's how I learned it. And then all you know, a bunch of years later, I'm coaching high school ball, and we would pray before football and baseball, basketball, all those games. And uh, more often than not, I would want a, I would want a ball player to say a prayer, and many times they would say this. And uh, you know, everybody would join in. And at that time, being a typical Protestant, I didn't think too much about reciting a prayer. And I bet many of you were probably raised the same way. Because I thought of it as kind of parroting a canned prayer. And that was too much like liturgy for this Mississippi boy raised in the Southern Baptist Church to to deal with. That came across, like I said, as liturgy. which was dead and dry religion. That's the way I thought about it. But at one point prior to a game, I said something because, and I can remember where we were, we were on our home field, but I said something like, all right, who's going to pray? And this time, let's not have a canned prayer or say a real prayer or something something to that effect. It's been a while back. And uh, afterwards... Somewhat, one of the boys prayed, and after 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 the prayer, one of the boys who was a Catholic, great kid, he's now a football coach himself. Um, he asked me, he said, "What's wrong with saying an our an our Father?" Which is what they tend to call it. And then I went on to extol to him all the merits of of, of praying in an extemporaneous manner. I was wrong. Now, y'all don't often hear me say that. It might be the case an awful lot, but you don't often hear me say it. But one of the things I've come to realize over the years of study is that reciting prayers like this was very common in the ancient world, both in Old Testament and New Testament times, and it was done this way for a reason. If we look at the liturgy of the Old Testament, it was standard practice to recite certain written prayers. Many of us have at least heard of this thing called the Shema. The Jews would say three times a day. We kind of talked about that last time we were, was it two weeks ago? Yeah, because J.J. was teaching last week. I want to thank J.J. He did a great job and told me he's going to put me out of business, and I hope he does. But... uh we talked about that a couple of weeks ago when Jesus is talking about wanting to be seen in public and he mentions standing on the street corner. We asked, 
What if people are just walking around and I mean, just go out on a corner and start praying? No. It's where, you, if, if when it was time, the call to prayer went out in the Jewish world with horns being blown, then wherever you were, you stopped and you prayed. But there were some people who would make sure they were around the busiest intersections, just so, a lot of times Pharisees, just so people could see them praying. And so this sort of public prayer, uh, quoting the Shema, that's, that's liturgy. That is quoting a, what I wrongly termed a canned prayer, and that, and that was done three times a day. It was also common in the church all the way up to the Reformation, and it's still common practice in the Catholic and Orthodox churches. But in an attempt to establish a more personal way of faith, that fell out of practice amongst many, if not most, of the Protestant churches. And in this, I believe we have erred because we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Now, everybody's sitting there thinking, uh-oh, are we going to start doing all that? I think some of it should be done. I don't have any plans to start doing that right now. I don't want to necessarily empty this place out. But I am going to say this. There was a reason for doing things that way, especially in a culture where most were not literate, okay, in an oral culture. And just as I learned, you see, the Lord's Prayer by saying it before every ball game, the repetition was there, in fact, to teach and to seal those words and should also seal the meaning into our hearts because repetition is a good teacher. We learn everything that way. How do you learn chords or how to make them and get your fingers from one spot to the other on guitar neck? By sitting there and playing over and over and over till your fingers hurt. How do you learn your lines for the play? Repetition. How do you learn your, your alphabet? How do we learn our times tables? if they still teach that. Uh, I don't know with this new math. I don't even know if you even have time to do But, so, so repetition is a good teacher. But some will say, just merely reciting things from rote memory becomes kind of banal, and it is this, it's in that that we lose the meaning of things. And this, and this is the way I always looked at it, that sort of thing leads to dead, dry religion. And I don't want dead, dry religion. I don't. I hate it. And so because of that, in our tradition, people are, oh, things should be extemporaneous, meaning kind of right there and, and from the heart. Because it can't be from the heart if you're actually reading it. That's the way the so-called logic goes. But somewhere, I think, you know, along the way, we've come to believe that speaking, I keep using this big word, extemporaneously is better. I've even heard people say that people shouldn't speak or pastors shouldn't teach from notes. If it's really, I've, I've been told that directly. If it's really in your heart, you don't need notes. And my answer is, if you studied enough to have enough in your head to teach the message, you would need notes. Now that comes across as mean, but I, I mean what I say there. It's only in the repetition of the repertoire that one has that they're able normally to get up and just speak and speak and speak and speak and speak for the most part. Now, Pastor Chuck, as you know, had enough memorized he could teach for hours without even cracking a book open. I cannot do that. Those if you, well, I won't go here, go there. But I know I can't do that. But the, the thinking is that it's just as speaking from, as if speaking from notes or reciting things from memory does away with the, the, the genuineness, that's even a word of a thing. But I don't believe that's the way God sees it because He's the one that designed the liturgy of the Old Testament. He's the one that designed how everything was supposed to go in the temple. Uh, uh, but we don't just seem to check the boxes when we write something or some liturgy from, for memory. That's not what He wants. And sadly, that can be the case. And that's the argument, is that if you, you do it I grew up um, in a church that was not liturgical, but if I went to stay with my grandmother, she went to a Methodist church. And they had the responsive readings, and if you've ever done that, you know, the, somebody's standing up there, and they read this, and you read this, and then they read that, and read this. And there was, a lot, there was more liturgy than ever was in any church I went to. And, but once again, we tend to think, well, that's just dead, dry, rote, that sort of thing. 
and we want to stay away from that. We want to be moved by the Spirit and, and energized, extemporaneous, and all that. Okay, here's the problem. Is that anything you do, whether it's extemporaneous or it's road or anything else, can become dead and dry. We can begin to go, just go through the motions in anything we do. We can begin to just check the boxes in anything we do. I would venture to say that those that say do away with all that and just be extemporaneous, I would venture to say that they go through the motions in a whole lot of their church services or some part of it also. You know? it, we have liturgy here. We generally sing the same amount of songs for about the same amount of time. Liturgy is, is in some ways just repetition of things. Y'all know what's going to happen. We're going to come in. We're going to sing four songs. Then probably Stephanie's going to get up or Abe and do announcements, and then you're going to have to listen to me for a while. And then I'm going to close in prayer, and then we're going to do another song. And that in and of itself, people coming through here Sunday, Sunday after Sunday and go through that by checking the boxes, never really experiencing God or checking in with God or listening or anything. They're just trying to get through it. Some of y'all are just trying to keep your eyes open. Mostly guys. As the older I get, I understand why that is. But you see, that stuff goes on. So we can't just say, well, that's dead and dry because you can do that. I don't care if it's the most Pentecostal, charismatic service you've ever been to and they're just one a half a notch away from handling snakes. You can get into the rhythm of that thing and not actually check into what's really going on. Either way, hey, however you want to look at it, the human heart is able to gloss over the truth of God and His Word by just going through the motions. And that's a condition of a sinful heart. It's not an issue with whether or not something is memorized or, or it's not, whether something is done regularly or not. Therefore, we need to see the importance of a prayer such as this and how saying it on a regular basis can actually help us. God put that in the Word for the repetition, to help seal that in. It's not to say that we aren't to pray any other way, God forbid. But there is a time and a place for both means of prayer as we see in the Bible. So let's look at this prayer and, and see that it is to be both recited and used as a template for more extemporaneous prayer. So look at Matthew 6, verse 7. And Jesus says, And when you pray... Do not heap up empty phrases, and that's what we tend to think of as Protestants, is liturgy. These are just empty phrases. That's not what it means. We'll get to that later. When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we, have, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into to, to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, a few weeks ago, when we were, at, were working up to this point where we start today, um, we've, we've gone over, we'd gone over verse 7 before. But we need to return to it to see because it, it, it's kind of a segue out of what he was saying as he moves into this sort of prayer, this model prayer. So we need to return to it to see that Jesus was speaking of the right attitude in prayer, not to be just to be heard by someone else, not to be seen as being pious or anything else. And he uses some hyperbolic stuff in there, like go and don't pray in public, go shut yourself in, your, go to the house, go to the closet, shut the door, hide, turn out the light. That's hyperbole. Otherwise, everybody has to take off every time they want to pray, you know. And we also talked about in their day, prayers were verbal, they were oral, they were spoken out loud, not necessarily just in someone's head. But um, remember, we aren't to pray in public just so people can hear us and think we're pious. We are explicitly told here not to pray like the Gentiles. What does that mean? Well, pagan prayers were known to be long and rambling and unintelligible. Let that sink in for a little while. 
It just went on and on and on, and it faster and faster and faster, and it ramps up and it crescendos, and it ramps up and it crescendos, and everybody gets worked into a frenzy. And then the faster it gets, the more rambling it sounds, more uh, barbaric, not barbaric, it's not the right word, more, the less intelligible it became. Because in the pagan world, the prayer is there to beg and manipulate the little G God into doing whatever you wanted. And so the longer you prayed, the more words you said, the more eloquent you were, the more food you stuck on their little shrine or altar, all of that's supposed to affect them to move them to your position. But that's not the way the Christian prayer works, not the way the Jewish prayer works, not at all. We don't have any of this. You don't see any of that. That's why Jesus says you don't need to be no long rambling prayers. It needs to be an intelligent, intelligible conversation between you and the Lord. There's no need for any necromancy. There's no need for any tea, reading the tea leaves, checking a sheep's liver, looking at the patterns of migrating. No need for that to figure out what's going on. He said right there, he already knows of what we have need. So there's no need to try to manipulate God. You're not going to be, God's not going to be manipulated anyway. So if He already knows what we need, why ask? Oh, well, He knows, so I can just don't have to go through that. And I, well, why is answered, uh, well, for one thing, it's a good exercise you got to understand that God wants to talk to us. And that's why throughout the Old Testament, when you see God speaking with His people and, and, and in prayers and everything else, the reason you don't have to jump through all those hoops, think back to the, the battle between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, and they're running around and jumping and getting louder and start cutting themselves and, do, and getting more and more animated. And, whoo, we got to do something to move Him. And, do, and the, I, people pray like that here. I mean, Christians try to do that. And they get more and more, ah, da, 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 and trying to, and then Elijah just was, when it's his turn, he's like, y'all done? Lord, God says, just talk to me. Just talk to me. That's all we got to do. We don't need all this jumping through hoops. We don't need all this junk. You don't need to get too loud or jumping around, swinging from the chandelier or anything else. Just talk to me. You don't need to go see a witch. You don't need to go see anyone else. Just talk to me. Because God wants to have the conversation. God wants a relationship, and He actually wants it more than we do. So just talk to me. And if you are married, you know that communication is key to a thriving, long-lasting relationship. Now I'll leave that there. Because I do. It's when I call home, and I get Daddy on the phone. How you doing, Dad? That's about a three-minute conversation. Unless something's wrong with a tractor or a truck or something, he wants to discuss it. Otherwise, yeah, it's good, it's fine. Here, I'll let you talk to your mama. Because guys just don't want to talk as much. Now, Mama's on the phone. I'm going to be there a while. You know, that's just the way it is. Their difference is wired in for the most part, generally speaking, between men and women. God did that. I'm going to ask him why one day. But that's just the way it is. But our relationship with God is no different in that communication. And how important it is. So God just says, talk to me. There's no reason, though, to do as the Gentiles are doing, but pray in this manner. So let's look at the prayer and try to break it down in order to plumb the depths of it. So he goes back to, let's go back to 9, verse 9. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, and I still remember it, O King James, you know, o our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom, which is good. That's one reason it's so easy to memorize because the King James was written for that purpose. But our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, we got to understand something. If this is the only way to pray, we got some serious issues because this prayer doesn't cover all, uh, all the aspects that you normally see in prayer. Specifically, it doesn't. There's no explicit confession of sin. There's no direct thanksgiving for blessings already received. There's no intercession for the needs of the world or 
for those to whom the disciples are sent. But all of these issues can be developed from this prayer if we understand all that Jesus is saying here. So at the time, now I want you to say this, Jesus is not coming up with anything new in this prayer. That might be sound strange to some folks, but he's not. Because at the time Jesus was teaching this, already in the synagogues you have something called a chadish. And it's doxology and prayer. And it's worded almost the exact same way as what you get here. But Jesus puts a twist into it. A couple of twists, actually. So there are a lot of similarities, but there, what is different is that Jesus speaks when he's praying this prayer when he says, y'all pray like this. He puts everything into the second person. So he then personalizes the prayer. Because the prayers up to then in the Kaddish, all that are worded almost exactly the same, are not our Father, but it's Father. God is, is out there. It's not personalized. And that speaks volumes, because the first thing we need to see in Jesus personalizing the prayer uh, is that He's doing that from the beginning. Because in the Gospels, if you pay attention, you see that Jesus refers to God as His Father several times. And that shouldn't come as a surprise as Jesus is the only begotten Son. We've studied exactly what that means in the, the thread of the firstborn. I'm not going to get into all that. But we would do well to remember that that phrase speaks of not necessarily chronology, but a special status given to Jesus. Because the firstborn was the one who got the inheritance. And then, we, of course, we see God flipping that upside down. But in the Old Testament, the use of the term Father, when it's related to Yahweh, is only seen about a dozen times. And then, most of the time, it's used metaphorically. Like, he is like a father who carries his son. It'll be something like that. But you really don't see the, person, the personalizing of it, or the, the closeness of it, or something like that. But, and that was because there was an assumed distance between God and even His people. You see that in the layout of the tabernacle and the temple. How many folks got to go up the mountain to Sinai? You had a, everybody basically had to stay at the bottom, most everybody, and then they had to stay behind the line there. And then some, Moses, Joshua, and some elders got to go up a certain distance. But at the end of the day, and then Moses and uh, uh, Aaron, excuse me, it was, Anyway, and then at the end of the day, it's only Moses who gets to go to the top. Everybody else is at a distance. The high priest gets to go in the Holy of Holies where the manifest presence of God was in the temple of the tabernacle. Nobody else. So there was that presumed distance. So speaking of God literally as a father or having that status, that's something pretty much foreign to the Old Testament. All right? But then when we get to the New Testament... Uh, we get Jesus commonly referring to God as Father. And then later, the Apostle Paul speaks to this when he talks about speaking of God as Abba. Not the Norwegian Swedish pop group, but Abba, which is not a Greek word, it's an Aramaic word that means Father or maybe Daddy. So here's a, here's a question we need to ask ourselves. When By the time Paul is teaching this, Hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem, years later after all that's going on in the book of Acts and later. How is it that all these Gentiles are referring to God as Abba or Father? It's because they've been reciting what we call the Lord's Prayer. It's already become a liturgy. It's already something they pray. I would venture to, I would make the wager if I were a betting man that it's been in, in a lot of places, substituted from the Shema, and it's been now being said three times a day, just as the Shema was for the Jews, because it's now become liturgy, and they're reciting that over and over. Why? If you get up hearing the same thing day after day after day, if you get up speaking the same thing day after, and I'm not talking about any name it, claim it garbage, all right? We're talking about common sense here. Uh, if you get up speaking the same thing every day, it has an effect on your life. You can speak nicely to people every day. Or I've seen children who've been browbeaten every day for most of their lives. And we, we can see the effect, either positive or negative, depending on how you speak to that child, the effect it has on their lives. So, 
It only makes sense that Paul says what he says later if this prayer was a part of the liturgy very early on. But Jesus has now moved the, the terminology from his prayer, my Father, speaking to his disciples, to be used by us, our Father. We are now able to say our Father. And that's more, that's, it, theologically, that's a lot bigger than you may think because what it means now is our status has now changed. Now, I don't just mean going from unbeliever to believer. It's way more than that. We get that same status ranked up there, you know, at least close to what Jesus is. We're not Jesus. I don't mean anything like that. But if you go into what we talk about divine counsel and that phrase sons of God and all that, that that entails, boom, this moves that right up there. So we may take this sort of thing lightly, but we shouldn't. But in Jesus' day, that was a big deal. Because as we went through the Beatitudes, to whom is he speaking? People with no status. And now he says, you can say our Father. To them, that's a big deal. Once again, we're like, yeah, okay, yeah, I get it. It's just a theological point. To them, it makes all the difference in the world. And it's part of the restoration of things going back to, way they, to the way they were in Eden. Because you had, remember, God was seen as a distance, at a distance. In Eden, they're walking with Him. Because gardens and mountains in the ancient Near East, it's the abode of the gods. If you're pagan, it's the abode of Yahweh if you're, if you're a believer in Yahweh. And so that closeness is now being restored. That status is now being restored. That's one of the first steps on the way to Eden be, being spread or recreated here on earth to, go, to taking back sacred space. You see how this fits together? If, we, if you just think about it, if we just read it and go, oh, yeah, that's a nice part of the prayer. Well, there's a lot of theology in this. So um, the restoration, Jesus is pointing out, if we're paying attention, that this is already begun. The next thing we should see in the prayer is the use of the word heaven. And some scholars now will use the term skies here, and there will be those who think that's a conspiracy to water down the Bible. It's not. It's actually trying to bring out something even better. Um, the reason they do this is because of the way we think of the word heaven. If I say, you know, go to heaven or the heavens, on it, most people think about sitting on a cloud, bling, plucking a harp, having little wings, looking like a little fat baby with wings on it, bling, and that's how we will spend eternity. Which brings me back to, I don't know if y'all remember that cartoon, The Far Side. There's one of those where the guy's sitting up there and he says, boy, I wish I'd brought a magazine. I don't, as much as I love, now if he's got a guitar, that would, I could do that longer than a heart. But the deal is, that's not our reality in eternity. But most people picture it that way. That's the way we moderns do, especially in the Western world. But that's not the way it was seen. The heavens were not something way through the ether sphere and out past the planets in some realm where we all just sit around plucking harps and singing stuff all the time. That's, that's not at all what it was. The heavens, the word in both Greek and Hebrew is the same as skies. Be translated either way. And the reason they saw it this way is because the heavens weren't just way out there. They come down to the earth. They overlap. They meet. Now, yes, God for us is, is, was up there. God to the pagans is up there on a mountaintop. That was common. But the two are not separate. The heavens or the skies and earth interact and intermingle and overlap all the time. The, they didn't make this distinction like we do between natural and supernatural. In fact, the meaning of supernatural has changed since the Enlightenment. It didn't used to mean something altogether not natural. It just was a different uh, level of natural. I'll put it that way. So that's what it's become. And so now you see folks trying to put skies in there to show us there's a lot more connection than we used to, uh, than we're accustomed to seeing. And that's why they use that term. But we see the word heaven 
And that, um, and we got to understand that because these two touched and interacted and moved and, and God is, God was here and moving around and all of that stuff that it's, he's not isolated up there and someday we go way up there. That's not what the Bible says. In the book of Revelation says, the new Jerusalem, it comes down here to earth. So I'm here to tell you for all eternity, heaven's not your home. It'll be here. It'll be new. It'll be different but it'll be here. So, we understand that. I want to bring that point out because we should think of heaven and skies as somewhat interchangeable and like I said, touching things going on down here. That brings us to the next line of the prayer where it says, hallowed or hallowed be your name. So what does the word hallowed mean? So we've got that here, hagiazo, uh, to make holy, to purify or consecrate, to mentally venerate, hallow, be holy, sanctify. So we want to sanctify your name. We want to make holy your name. We'll just see it, I would say, is something, that name is something holy other. You also have, this goes back to one of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 27, 20 verse 7, says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And if you're like me, the main thing that meant was you can't use God's name as a cuss word. That's taking the Lord's name in vain. We weren't even allowed to say gosh. That was too close. We couldn't say God, or you know, golly gee wally, if you remember Beaver Cleaver. That was about as... That's about as close as you could get in my house, all right? Let alone anything else that you might have heard out there. Um, but that is not the main point of what the commandment means because to take the Hebrew word being nasa means to carry. We're not to carry the Lord's name in vain. Not thinking about just speaking, and you shouldn't do that, because that is a vanity applied to the name. But we should not, we as believers, as imagers of God, are not to carry the Lord's name in vain. Meaning we're not to carry it, use it, um, as imagers taking this title, being believers of God, we are not to treat His name in a flippant manner. Remember Daddy told me one time, Son, at the end of the day, all you've got is your name. What does that mean? Eb? No, it means your reputation. We are not to carry the reputation of Yahweh, His name, in a flippant manner. We are to be imagers and be good ones of that. We aren't to do anything, speak, live in such a way, or do anything that would besmirch the character of God or hinder His will. Because when this is done, to put it in modern vernacular, God's name gets bad press. Yes, another one of those Christians. Every time a leader falls, every time one of us goes out there and acts like a moron in front of others, loses our temper, acts a fool, yep, and he's supposed to be a Christian. Boy, that's a big blow to God's name. God's name is to be venerated and seen as holy other, and sacred. Especially, even I would say, I would say this, especially in this room. Because we don't treat it as such, but it's supposed to be a holy place. It's, it's supposed to be seen that way. Do y'all remember the story of the Exodus? When all that was going on there at the beginning, and Moses comes to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh states that, who is this God? I don't know who this God is. He knows lots of gods. The Egyptians had tons of them. He's also aware of the other ancient Near Eastern gods, the Syrian gods, the Assyrian gods, the Babylonian gods, the Akkadian gods, the Sumerian gods, the Greek gods. He's aware, he's aware of all those. And now you come in here and tell me you've got a god. I don't, I've never heard of him. Like my kids, you know, will come up, Dad, you ever heard of this guy? He had a hit record? I never heard of it. You haven't heard of him? He did, he's, uh, I've heard of Elvis. And the Beatles and Johnny Cash and the Stone. When this dude sells that many records, come and talk to me. Until then, I don't care. I probably won't care then. Because it's 
in my book, it's not even music. But uh, it's my humble but correct opinion. But by the time, it, this is, and this is what God is doing during the Exodus, is he's making a name for himself. He really is. He will later tell Israel who, what his name is. But he's, at the time of the Exodus, he's making a name for himself and showing that, in a sense, there's a new sheriff in town and you, Pharaoh, who are supposed to be a demigod, you can't do a doggone thing about it. And neither can any of these other little G-gods you got running. They can't do a doggone thing about it. And he does it so well, God does, that by the time they get through the wilderness and they're coming to Jericho, what does Rahab, Rahab, what does she say? We've heard. We've heard about your God. We know what he does. Everybody's quaking because nobody, no, our gods can't stand up to him. That's what we're talking about. God's name has now been glorified and people fear him and respect him because they, what they are learning is that he is the ultimate. Of course, we know he's the only creator God that there is. So we can see the importance of God's name, God's reputation. And we should already understand this, how important our name or reputation should be amongst other folks. And we should see how, how that relates to what Jesus is saying should be prayed in the prayer. So when they say, Lord, hallowed be your name, to have it respected, to have it venerated, as set apart, something other, holy other than, someone holy other than as being up here, that is a big deal. If we go to Ezekiel 36, if you want to read that chapter, and it's long, it runs long. But what you see there is a long-running recap of Israel's history and how they transgressed their covenant with God. And what is specifically mentioned amongst other things is that in doing so, you have disgraced and brought shame to my name. Wow, well, we're backing up. There's a reason your employer, or they used to, used to have certain codes of conduct, how you could dress, what you could wear, what you could say, even if you got out in public, maybe off the clock, you know, if all of a sudden it's on the news that, you know, you do done something real stupid, they could fire you. Why? Because what you're doing throws shade on the company. What you're doing in the biblical context, whatever you do, now we're in a very individualistic society. So, hey, it's mine. Just this morning, driving in here, I pull up beside a guy, I look down there, he's got some wording on the side, on the rear quarter panel that says, my life, my rules. I say, yeah, dude, you couldn't be more wrong. And that's what we think. My life, my rules. It's my body, I can do what I want to with it. I can kill a baby if I want to. I don't think so. It's not your body. God gave it to you. Whatever you're good at, it's not yours. God gave you those giftings. And it's not your rules, your life. It's God's world. And you're free. You can do. you got free will. You can do what you want. But, but at some point, God's going to come up and say, how's that going for you? So I saw that, and it made me think of this. Because that sort of thinking, that very individualistic thinking, is it doesn't matter what you say. I'm getting mine. It's about me. Well, in the biblical culture, y'all already know this, it's not, it doesn't work that way. Very communal. Tribalistic, honor, shame culture. No, son, you're not going to go out there and act stupid because it's going to make the family look bad. It's going to make the village look bad. It's going to make the tribe look bad. It's going to make our name drop in status. We won't be seen as civilized good folks anymore. All because you chose to be stupid. And so people kept a tighter rein on things. And the culture was more on the same page. So everybody's playing by the same rules, and we just don't do that. That's gone nowadays. There used to be certain things you just didn't do, especially in public. Now, you turn on the news, people are just cussing left and right. You've got senators being quoted saying this, bleep, 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 in an interview. That, even no matter how badly they spoke in private, you didn't do that in, in television. That was unbecoming. They don't care anymore. You can wear a hoodie and shorts to Congress. Well, it's about me, and I want to be comfortable. No, 
at some point it ceases to be about any of us as individuals there. But the point I need to try to make here is that all of these things would bring disgrace and shame to God's name, and it shows how the other nations saw Israel and how they saw that the name of Yahweh was being brought low. The example is that when God's people act like the unbeliever, they're seen as hypocrites. You talk stuff, we don't see any change in you, we don't see any difference. When God's people live in such a way that brings judgment upon Him, this is what happened. This is why they're exiled. And that's what we'll be reading about here in Ezekiel 36. When judgment was brought upon them, their actions and their lifestyles then incurred the, judge, the judgment of God, what they're doing, which brings further shame to the name of God. The actual punishment, the exile, brings shame to God. Does that make sense? All right. And why are they exiled? Because of the way they've been living for a long time, which is no different than the surrounding nations. So let's look at what Ezekiel has to say regarding this. Now, as we're reading this, it's going to be up here. What jumps out as you pertaining to the prayer that, about which Jesus has been speaking? So we're going to be here, Ezekiel 36, verses 18 through 27. We're just doing this. Read the whole thing and what the prophet's saying. But he's speaking... He's going to give you a quick recap of Israel's history, and then look at what God focuses on. It says here, this is dealing with their exile and, and their judgment, So I poured out my wrath upon them, Israel, for the blood that they had shed in the land, for the idols which they had with which they had defiled it. I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed through the countries. In accordance with their ways and their deeds, I judged them. Remember, I've told you, it's the way God works. He gives you what you want. And then he says, how's that going for you? So according to their ways and their deeds, meaning it's linked to what they wanted and what they did, I judged them. But when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name. All right, ding, ding, that's a hint. All right. Uh, they profane my holy name in that people said of them, now we're seeing what everybody else is saying, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they had to go out of His land. It's cosmic geography. But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they came. Therefore say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act. Now we're getting in a little bit of eschatology here, prophetic sense. O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you, now listen to this, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. So you're going to take back his name and all that it means, and that will be restored. This means what he means there by vindicating. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. Now listen to this. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Meaning it won't be hard anymore due to the immersion of the Spirit. And I will put my Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So as you can see, God's name is very important to Him as it ours should be to us because it's His reputation that is at stake. So how, think of this, how are people supposed to want to worship Him and only Him if His reputation is so bad? If he gets a half a star on Yelp or whatever that thing goes. Nobody goes to that. I don't care how cheap you do it. If you got a half star on Yelp, nobody is using you to cut their, your grass or anything else. Nobody's doing that. Likewise, why should we want to worship him if his people are no better than anyone else? 
But what we're also seeing here, see, because all that we just read in Ezekiel, that's, that's been going on since Genesis 3 to some extent. And it's working its way throughout the Old Testament. And then by the time you get to the last few verses we quoted there, now he's speaking of what he will do and the whole deal of taking away the heart, the heart that's stone and putting a heart of flesh, my spirit in you. That should be already be somewhat familiar with us or to us. Um, so it, you see that's working. And then Ezekiel starts talking about the restoration of the name of God. I will restore my name. How does that happen? Why is it included in the prayer? So being so, hallowed be thy name is not just, this is a part of the prayer where we say something good about God and check that off the list. All right, we said this. Said something good about God. Yeah, I want him, but people, yeah. It's so much more than that. This is an eschatolog eschatological thing. This is God saying, or Jesus saying, I am going to restore my name, I'm going to restore the name of the Father, and now, he's, as he's doing all this, he's linking heaven and earth together, which we saw earlier in the prayer, in their time, including them in the family, as they are now able to say, our Father. And so when this prayer gets prayed, what Jesus is saying and what we are saying, if we're really thinking about it, is that what is happening is this is the part of the way that God's name is restored. So when we say, hallowed be your name, we're not just saying, God, I hope everybody loves you. We're saying, no, this is part of the process. We are praying for that to, be, to happen, that to have already happened, that to be fulfilled. You see how this, the prayer is not just, yeah, yeah. no. We're asking, wanting, desiring. We'll get into that next week. We're talking about thy will be done means desire. It's the same Hebrew word translated covet. But God's will, you see, as you get on down deeper in the prayer, is that part of this, when everything is restored, is that His name is restored. And so in saying this, we're praying for the fulfillment or the consummation of that. And as you keep going through the prayer, what you see is we have a part in making that happen. So the prayer is a lot more than just saying something nice about God and asking for bread, or anything else. It is an eschatological request, a means of seeing what is to come in the future. And since the king, that kingdom was inaugurated <clears throat> at Jesus' resurrection and ascension, how we're supposed to already be moving toward that. So, once again, Jesus links both heaven and earth together. We've seen that in their time. He includes them as well as us. In the family, as we're now able to say, our Father in this plan that is coming together in the kingdom of which Jesus has been speaking throughout this Sermon on the Mount. And we're saying that this, <clears throat> as all this comes together, where the name of God will once again be hallowed and revered as it should and not be used as a curse word. And certainly no one can be um, accused, rightfully so, of not living out what's supposed, what, the way we're supposed to do that. This is part of what Jesus is telling them to ask for in the prayer. Once again, can't, once again can we see how eschatological it is? That it's more than just, no, 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 no. It's packed. It's loaded. Every line with Old, Old Testament hyperlinks. And then there's even more eschatology in there. We'll see this as we go. But what we need to understand today is, is, is that this prayer is deeper than many of us have been led to believe. And we need to see that the repetition of this in other liturgies is not necessarily dead, dry religion. Any practice can become dead and dry. Saying a blessing before you eat, for those that do that. That can hurry like, oh, da, 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 da. Okay, now let's see. Anything. And that's a good thing. You should do that. We do that. Should do that. Anything can be just rattle off and going over and not checking the box. I don't care how good it is. So to stick it in, stick that sort of thing in the dead dry area just because of that is wrong because it does not speak to the heart of the matter, which is a sinful heart. It's the heart that determines whether it's dead and dry or not. 
But if we were able to wake up every day with all that this prayer says and all that it means in our heads, I would add, and I would add in our heart, hearts, it would change the way we live. Because that's one of the purposes of this prayer. That's the one of the purposes of the repetition of it, as well as any others. So let us not fall into the trap of allowing our hearts to no longer keep God's name hallowed. That should go without saying. But let us not fall in the trap of just going through the motions with anything regarding our faith. The whole, whole rigmarole in the act of coming to church, people just go through the motions on that. That's just what we do. Especially in the South, that's what we do. Go to other places, maybe not so many people in church, as far as all the numbers are. But the danger is, so we're, we're so godly down here. Well, not necessarily. We got our problems. So it's just not the numbers. You know, it's just growing up, it's just what you do down here, which means you're going through the motions. A lot of people are. So, anything, once again, can become dead and or dry. But we are here, and this is what we got to remember, we are here to the carry the name of our God in such a way that others want to do the same. That's making disciples, part of it. And as Ezekiel said, that will only happen by the Spirit which He has placed in the heart of the believer. So let's pray for that also. Would you bow your heads? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you once again for your word and all that it means. Lord, we thank you that you replace that heart of stone with a heart of flesh, one that can actually beat and was it isn't so hard, one that's malleable to your will. Lord, we thank you that you place within there the heart of every believer your spirit, Lord, who empowers us. Your Holy Spirit empowers us to actually do and carry out the things that you want done according to your will. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for that being in the heart of every believer. So Lord, today we pray for that. We don't remember anything else. We pray for that to happen. And I do pray, Lord, that the recitation of this, or other things, Lord God, that mean something to us, that we won't just shy away from those because of our tradition. Because you've stated, you've put those things in here so that they can be remembered. And we need to be reminded of them, sometimes multiple times a day. And thank you for doing it, Lord. You know how we learn and you know how to teach us. You've been doing it since time began. So we thank you for that, Lord God. Father, we ask you to bring peace to our nation. We're all aware of the attempt on former President Trump's life yesterday. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on, that is wrong. And so, Father, maybe this will unite the nation in some way. And we pray for that. Pray for the peace of our nation. We pray for the peace of Israel. We pray for peace in Ukraine and the other places in the world that don't make the news, but are, that are under a lot of fighting and violence and bloodshed where vulnerable people are being hurt constantly. Lord, we, have, we ask You to intervene. And where we can as individuals and Christians or Christian organizations, Lord, help us to be there. Red Cross, Doctors Without Borders, what have you, missionaries, whatever. Father, be with us and guide us in Your wisdom on that. Father, help us to see as we work through this prayer the larger scope of what You want us to be and who you want us to be and how you want us to be that way. And we thank you for that part in your plan, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.